I, I want to bring in um, Tom Bosser. It, the, the NATO alliance says that there is a price to pay here. And, and Tom is a national security analyst and former White House Homeland Security Advisor. Uh, Tom, thanks for being with us. It's always good to discuss this with you. What do you make of NATO activating its response force for the first time in history? What exactly does that deterrence and defense mean in this particular role? I think it's an incredibly wise move. I'd have recommended it. <clears throat> in fact, I'm uh, not surprised by it at all. What we're seeing now is Putin in a completely unpredictable use of force right on all of their borders. So uh, at, at this stage, it's only uh, almost obvious that NATO activate this force. There's so much room for miscalculation here. Uh, in a lot of ways, Putin has let the genie out of the bottle. We can have Russian jets incurring, you know, in, um, um, flying into other airspace, NATO airspace, Turkish airspace, uh, Polish airspace, drawing fire and leading this thing into directions that we can't control. His military will take actions even without his permission if that happens and it could spiral. So NATO has an obligation here to uh, you know, kind of circle the wagons. Yeah, and, and, and Tom, we heard today from the Czech Republic that uh, the Czech Republic and Poland restricting airspace to Russian carriers. Um, the Russians do not have superiority over Ukraine. Ukrainian air defenses are still working. Uh, how significant is that for this fight against the Russians? It's significant for, I guess, two reasons. Uh, one, it's a bit surprising that they haven't yet carried that out. It's usually the first step or one of the early steps in the Russian playbook. Or really, I think, in any military playbook, or at least uh, that's what most of the generals have been saying. Uh, we've seen this play out in the past. There's this uh, acronym in, in Russian military planning called SOD SIT, where they go after strategically uh, damaging all of the enemy's critical infrastructure targets. Uh, it's pretty standard in their military planning uh, playbook. So I suspect if they really want to, they will do it. I think it reveals, though, at least to me, that Putin does not have a clear military objective. At least it's not clear to any of the observers uh, that I talk to. We don't know what he wants to achieve or whether he has the force adequate to achieve it and sustain it. If he really wants to take on uh, maintaining control over Ukraine, given what we've seen in the, in the defiant eyes of the Ukrainian people, he better have more forces ready to stay there longer. And I think he's got to decide whether he wants that objective. If he does make that decision, they'll take out air defense systems pretty quickly. Tom, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that NATO members would need to discuss whether a cyber attack against a NATO ally would then trigger that Article 5 response from the alliance. Talk about that for a second. What might that response look like? Yeah, this has been brewing for a very long time. In fact, one of the NATO members, Estonia, uh, many people will remember, uh, they were attacked, a cyber attack that devastated their economy and their government systems by Russia. And they're a NATO member, and they asked NATO to consider that an act of war that would trigger the collective defense obligation under Article 5. And in fact, NATO chose not to uh, take that action uh, as, a, as a justification to attack further Russia. Uh, that's been a pending debate ever since. I think context here matters. So if that cyber attack causes physical harm, loss of life, and if it's done with the backdrop of this threatening buildup of military forces, I think NATO will view it differently. But there'll not be anybody arguing lightly to take any small pinprick cyber attack as a justification to get into war with Russia. It'll have to be something significant. Uh, but it certainly qualifies. And I'm glad that she said they're discussing it because whether it's a cyber attack or a missile, if it kills people and destroys your territory or your possessions, uh, that's, that's grounds for defending, defending yourself and it's grounds for a collective defense. President Biden spoke with Ukrainian President Zelensky again today. And after that conversation, Zelensky tweeted that they discussed strengthening sanctions, concrete defense, assistance, and, and an anti-war coalition. What does he mean by that? And what role could U.S. forces play in that kind of coalition? Well, I can see a lot of U.S. force deployment to, to take up the backfill roles of other uh, you know, European forces, if the Europeans start to send mil direct military aid into Ukraine, uh, I think the president's been pretty clear. And at this point, even if he changed his mind, I don't know if he's got the domestic support 
for sending American forces directly into Ukraine. Uh, I think that what he discussed, though, on these sanctions being strong enough or weak enough is a, is a really unfortunate sign of the stress that the Ukrainian people are under. I don't think any additional sanctions will have the immediate effect uh, that President Zelensky is seeking, although I don't blame him for asking. We should pretty much try anything at this stage. I think instead most of these sanctions are designed to punish Russia and to attack their operating budget so that they can't sustain this for a long period of time. That's not very satisfying to people who are in harm's way uh, watching their neighbors being killed. But it's not a direct defensive tool, and I think Zelensky is uh, trying to apply it in that way. And, Tom, you're talking about the, st the stress that Ukrainians are under. The U.N. says hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are on the move through the country, whether it's, it's from the Donbass region all the way uh, over to where I am in Poland uh, because of this Russian invasion. They're talking about tens of thousands of them have already crossed uh, into other countries. How is this, uh, what, what is obviously going to turn into some sort of refugee crisis, uh, how is that going to affect Europe and the U.S.? It's going to strain everyone's ability to take care of their fellow man. We're going to see European countries having to accept a large diaspora of fleeing Ukrainians. All of us want to. American and European hearts are often larger than our, uh, than our bread baskets. So I'm not, I'm not afraid of the willingness of the European host countries or American host countries. Uh, but there will be an adjustment period there where you handle large inflows of people. You have to find housing and food sources adequate to take care of their needs. And remember, this is all happening in winter for a reason. I think you're seeing a lot of European hesitancy to turn on certain sanctions and address the SWIFT issue because, like it or not, they are dependent on Russian heating, oil, and gas. And so you don't want to freeze people to death. You want to make sure that there's a flow of energy source and you want to make sure that these refugees have a place uh, where they can find shelter and protection from the shelling. So I think that we'll see uh, a generous community, a generous global response, and some pretty significant suffering in the interim. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that happening here now in Poland as uh, Poland welcomes those refugees even in, in lines that are miles long. Tom Bossert, always good to talk to you. Thanks for the expertise. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.